now it's gone. Okay. Well, if you've been around redemption for any length of time, you know that we've got uh, a real uh, deep connection to the Gospel of Luke. Uh, over the last three years, we have we've taken uh, big chunks and worked our way through the various passages and scriptures of the Gospel of Luke with this desire and goal to preach through the entire Gospel, so we can have this incredible picture of who Jesus is. And so for the next 12 weeks, we're going to be looking at the rest of Luke's gospel. So we've got 13 chapters we're going to cover in 12 weeks, but we're going to take a slightly different approach than what we've done in the past. And of course, we've tried various different angles at looking at the gospel of Luke. Uh, but as we break down this section of, of scripture, what we're going to find is that Jesus is in his final journey to Jerusalem. And in that journey, Jesus reveals four really important roles that he fulfills as Messiah. We're going to find out that Jesus is our healer, that he's a teacher, that he's a ruler, and that he's a savior. And these last remaining chapters do an amazing job of reflecting his ministry and his teaching in those roles. So as we study together these next 12 weeks, we're going to see uh, these parts of Jesus really come to life. And so I hope you're excited about this and we'll have much to celebrate at the end of the summer. Uh, but today what we're going to do is we're going to kick off a three-week mini-series where we're going to discover that Jesus is a healer. He's a healer. And I'm really excited for these next few weeks to be talking about this. So everyone, let's just make sure we're on the same page. We're dialed in. So everyone say healer. Awesome. Oh, good. Uh, go ahead and open your Bibles to Luke chapter 15 is where we're going to be camped out. Luke chapter 15. If you're using a device to follow along, we use the Christian Standard Bible here at Redemption, so make it a little easier. Also, at any point in time, we have uh, free Bibles at our welcome home table back there. Just, you're not going to distract anybody. Just go ahead and pop up, go back there and get one, and that's our gift uh, to you today. So Luke chapter 15, we're going to be starting in verses 11 through 32. We're going to be talking about the parable of the lost son, or as it's often known as what? The parable of the prodigal son. Right. So let's pick up in verse 11. He also said, so Jesus is in the middle of a teaching series dealing with the Pharisees, the tax collectors, all of these uh, adversaries of his ministry. And so Jesus, he also said, a man had two sons, verse 12, the younger of them said to the father, father, give me my share of the estate that I have coming to me. And so he distributed the assets to them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered together all that he had, and he traveled to a distant country where he had squandered his estate in foolish living. Verse 14, after he had spent everything, a severe famine struck the country, and he had nothing. Then he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who had sent him into the fields to feed pigs. Verse 16, he longed to eat his fill from the pods that the pigs were eating from, but no one would give him anything. And when he came to his senses in verse 17, he said, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food? And here I am dying of hunger. And so I'll get up, I'll go to my father and I'll say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. Verse 19, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired workers. And so he got up and he went to his father. But while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with what? Compassion. And he ran and he threw his arms around his neck and he kissed him and he said, the, he, the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father told his servants, quick, bring out the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, then bring the fattened calf, verse 23, and let us celebrate with a feast, slaughter it, let's celebrate. Verse 24, because the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So the, they began to celebrate. Verse 25. Now his older son was out in the field and he came near to the house and he heard music and dancing. And so he summoned uh, some of the, one of the servants questioning what these things meant. Your brother's here, he told him. And your father slaughtered the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. Verse 28. Then he became angry and didn't want to go in. So his father came out and pleaded with him. But he replied to his father, look. I've been slaving many years for you, and I've never disobeyed your orders. That you, you never gave me a goat so I could celebrate with my friends. 
But when this son of yours, who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him. Verse 31, son, he said to him, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is what? Found. How many of you know this story? Yep. So the, the parable of the Good Samaritan and the parable of the prodigal son are arguably the most profound, beloved stories of Jesus all throughout history, right? Even non-Christians know these stories, right? People know these because they're so popular. And I think you could even argue that the, the parable of the lost son, the prodigal son, is the most famous, beloved story of Jesus ever. It's the longest of Jesus' parables. And what we know is that Shakespeare wrote plays based on it. Rembrandt painted a painting of the story of the prodigal son. It's had a massive, it's had a massive impact on history, which tells us that it strikes a chord deep within the human experience. Amen? It strikes a chord. And so as we enter into the story, I first want us to acknowledge the characters and who they are in this story. And so the main character of the parable is the forgiving father who remains constant throughout the story. It's a beautiful picture of God. Don't miss that. And in telling the story, Jesus identifies himself with God in his loving attitude toward the lost. And the younger son symbolizes the lost, the tax collector, the sinner of that day. And the older brother represents the self-righteous, the, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law of that day. And then in the, in the middle of all of this is this central theme that exists. And the central theme of this parable is here, watch, restoration. That's the theme. It's restoration. The restoration of a believer into a right relationship with the father. The restoration of family. It's the type of restoration that is tangible and available. Not, not just for us to only have our relationship with God restored, but for us to have our relationship restored with the people in our lives that we love. It's a powerful story of restoration. So I want to jump in. I want us to unpack this incredible story. We're going to begin with verse 12. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that I have coming to me. And so he distributed the assets to them. And so we start out with this younger son who is desperate for independence. Can anybody relate? I mean, you're desperate for independence. And he's asking his father for his share of the inheritance early, which would have been half of what the older brother would receive. So let me break that down for you. Essentially, one third of the inheritance goes to the younger brother and two thirds of the inheritance goes to the older brother. This has been a, a custom for Jewish families that goes all the way back to the book of Deuteronomy. And although it was perfectly within his right to ask for his cash out, it's certainly not a loving thing to do because it was implying that he wished his father was dead. How else do you get an inheritance? So instead of getting angry at the son, the father patiently grants him his request, which is amazing. So this is a picture, gang. Watch, watch, look. This is a picture of God letting a sinner go his own way and we all possess this foolish ambition to be independent, amen? Which leads often to a life of dissatisfaction and disappointment. And in verse 13, we read that he travels to a distant country and it's evident from his previous actions that he already made the journey in his heart, didn't he? I mean, he already decided, I'm, I'm going, man. He already knew where he was going and and where he wanted to leave to. He already made that decision. So now we've got this physical departure, which is simply a display of his willful disobedience to all the goodness that his father had offered him. And so now he's off to live his best life. He's off to follow his heart. And in the process, he squanders all his father had worked for so hard on selfish, shallow fulfillment, losing, here, watch, everything. He lost everything. 
And to make things worse, his financial ruin is followed by a natural disaster of a famine, which he had not prepared for. So he's broke, homeless, and starving. And at this point, I think we can all agree that this dude is desperate. You ever been desperate before? You ever felt desperate? And so he sells himself into physical slavery to a Gentile farmer and finds himself feeding pigs, which if you know anything about Jewish custom and tradition is the most detestable job for a Jew because pigs were what? Unclean animals. And just when he thought he couldn't get any worse, he longed to eat the pig's food because he had nothing to eat and no one would show him any mercy. The text clearly says in verse 16 that no one would give him anything. No one. So even these pigs are living a better life than he is in this moment. And so now this younger brother is driven to his lowest and the sun begins to reflect on his condition. It's often when we're at rock bottom, amen, that we begin to really think about our situation. We begin to open our eyes. And he realizes that his father's servant had it better than he did. And his painful circumstances help him to see the father in a new light, and it brings him hope. And this is an important illustration that Jesus is making. Please don't miss this today. This is the picture of a sinner discovering the destitute condition of his life because of sin. It's a realization that apart from God, there is no hope. None. This is when a repentant sinner allows the conviction to take hold and longs to return to a restored relationship with the Father. That's the picture. And we're seeing that truth unfolds in what happens next. Look at verses 17 and 18 in the text. It says, when he came to his senses, that's a good gift, isn't it? He said, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food? And here I am dying of hunger. I'll get up and I'll go to my father and I'll say to him, father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. Now, at first glance, look, let's be honest. Here, watch. Let's be honest. At first glance, it looks like he may not be truly sorry right? It looks like he might be motivated by his hunger and his desperate condition, okay? But I'd argue that he is truly sorry, and here's why. He's willing to give up his rights as his father's son to take on the position of a servant. I'm not worthy to be called your son, so I'll be dead to you in that way if it just means you can provide for me. So I would argue that he is legitimately sorry. Look at verse 19. It says, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired workers. And he might be hungry. He might be exhausted. But this man is broken, gang. He's broken. And he is demonstrating a true humility, a true repentance, not based on what he said, but based on what he's willing to do. You hear me? Repentance aren't, it's not what you say, but it's what you're willing to do. And what he eventually does, we see that in the text. He realizes that he had no right to claim a blessing when he returns to his father, nor does he have anything to offer except the life of service in repentance of his previous actions. And so with that, he is prepared. Look, he's prepared to fall at his father's feet. He's prepared to fall at his father's feet and hope Hope for forgiveness and mercy. And so Jesus portrays the father as waiting for the son. Do you see that in the text? This is my favorite part. Perhaps daily searching that distant road, hoping to see his son walking home. But on this day, on this day, gang, here, watch. The father notices him while he's still a long way off. Look at verse 20. So he got up and he went to his father, but while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with, what's that word again? Compassion. And so he ran 
Not the son, the father. The father ran and threw his arms around his neck and he kissed him. The father's compassion in this moment is incredible. I need you to feel that. It paints just a beautiful picture of what it looks like to set aside pride and the need to be right for the sake of love and restoration. How often does our pride and our need to be right get in the way of fixing something? Anybody guilty of that? Oh, cool. Five of us? You liars. We're all guilty of that, man. I'm, I'm gu deeply guilty of that. Check this out. In Jesus' day and culture, it was considered inappropriate for a man to run. It wasn't customary. Men didn't run. And I got to say, as a sidebar, I can really get behind this idea personally. You know what I mean? I don't think anyone should ever run unless you're being chased. I think that's just a fundamental principle of life, personally. But here's this father running to greet his son. So, okay, here, look at me. We got to ask the question. Why would he break his customs? Why would he break the tradition for a child who had sinned against him? What would cause a man to do that? Well, the obvious answer is because he loved him. He loved his son. And he was eager to show him that love and restore the relationship. And when the father reaches his son, not only does he throw his arms around him and he greets him with a kiss, but he's so filled with joy at the return of his son that he doesn't even let him finish his confession. He interrupts him. He doesn't question him. He doesn't lecture him. Instead, he un watch, unconditionally forgives him and accepts him back into the family. There was no sit down, no, hey, we're going to walk through this first, pal. No, my son is home. Hmm. The father running to his son, greeting him with a kiss and ordering the celebration is a picture, gang. Please don't miss this. It's a picture of how our heavenly father feels towards sinners who repent. When we repent, the Lord celebrates. God greatly loves us and he is patiently waiting for us to repent so he can show us great mercy. And so the prodigal son was satisfied to return home as a slave, but to his surprise, to the shocking reality that he's now restored back into full privilege of being the father's son. Oh, he's not a slave at all, gang. He had been transformed from the state of being an outcast to complete restoration. This is what, this is what God's grace does to us. This is what it does. It transforms everything. Not only are we forgiven, but because of God's grace, we are received as children's, heirs of God, co-heirs with Jesus to the kingdom. And look how the father celebrates, man. He orders the servants to bring the best robe and no doubt it's one of his own. And that robe would have signified dignity and honor. And he brings out a ring for the son's hand. It was a sign of authority and sonship. brings out a pair of sandals for his feet. Why? Because he's not a servant. Servants didn't wear shoes in these days. But sons did. A fattened calf is prepared, a party is held, and it's not just any party. I mean, this is a rare and complete celebration. Here's why. Here, watch this. Had this younger brother been dealt with according to the law, had he had been dealt with according to the law, there would have been a funeral and not a celebration. You hear me? There would have been a funeral and not a celebration. I love what Psalm 103 says. It says, the Lord does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. 
For as high are the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Instead of condemnation, there is rejoicing for the son who had been dead but is now alive. He had been lost, but now he is found. But not everybody is thrown down at this shindig, are they? The oldest son, who once again illustrates the Pharisees, the scribes, right, the adversaries of Jesus, this brother was angry and bitter, and it's obvious by his words and his action because when his brother comes home, he's not showing any love to him, and he's not showing any love to his father because one of the duties of the oldest son would have included reconciliation between father and son. That's kind of his job in this culture. He would have been the host of the party to celebrate his brother's return, yet he remains in the field instead of in the house where he was supposed to be. I'm convinced he's not the only one who's ever gotten angry at how a parent has treated a child when you are the sibling of that child and you feel like you're being treated unfairly and they're getting more. I'm sure we've felt that before. But because this son is out in the field, ignoring what's happening, the reality is it would have been a public, dispray, a public disgrace upon his father. Still, the father shows patience, doesn't he? He shows patience. He doesn't get angry. He doesn't yell. But he goes to his hurting son And he lets him share his pain. And he lets him share his frustration. Look at verses 28 through 30. Then he became angry and didn't want to go in. So his father came out and pleaded with him. Verse 29. But he replied to the father, look, I have been slaving many years for you, and I've never disobeyed your orders, yet you've never even given me so much as a goat. But when this son of yours comes home after devouring your assets with prostitutes, you bring out the big guns for him. The older brother became blinded. Here, watch. This is important. The older brother became blinded by his own self-righteousness. In the kingdom of heaven, there's no room for self-righteousness. There's no room. He was focused on himself. And in essence, the older brother is saying that he's the one worthy of the celebration Look, I've, I've been a model kid. Nothing. The father's just ungrateful. So there's no joy in the brother's arrival. And he was so consumed with the issue of justice and equity that he fails to see the value of his brother's repentance and return, lest we all make that mistake. He fails to see repentance in 1 John chapter 2, it says, anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in darkness. If you hate your brother, you're still in darkness. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness. He does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded him. So the older brother allows anger to take root in his heart to the point that he's unable to show compassion to his brother or his father. And so he chooses, here's what he chooses. And I think sometimes we do this too. You ready? Watch. He chooses suffering and isolation over restoration and reconciliation. He chooses suffering and isolation over restoration and reconciliation. He sees his brother's return as a threat to his own inheritance. After all, why should he have to share his portion with a brother who squandered his? But the father, the father, the father who is patient and loving seeks to bring restoration. Look at verse 31. He says, son, son, you are always with me and everything I have, not two thirds, not one third, not half, son, I see 
I see you. And that's why everything I have is yours. But the older son, the older brother, he never utilizes the blessings of, to his disposal, right? At his disposal. Instead, he's focused on working for this father's approval. And so he failed to recognize that he already had it. Sometimes we're working so hard for the approval of someone, not stopping to realize we already have it. His father loved him because of who he was, not because of what he could do. And this is how God the Father looks at us. Look at me. This is how God the Father looks at you and me. There is nothing we can do to earn his favor or love. We aren't worthy of it. Our sin, our failure, our pride, our need for independence separates us from him. But because God is good, he loves us and he calls us into new life, restoring our relationship with him through Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. And so this parable gang has a lot to teach us about the power of relationships and reconciliation. And primarily, it teaches us that because of sin, we are in a broken relationship with God. But through repentance and through faith in Christ, that relationship can be, here, healed. That relationship can be healed. It teaches us that even though we are in Christ, we still are going to sin. We are still going to bring distance in our relationship with God and other people. But when we do sin and we are convicted and we confess to the Lord, you know what he does? He doesn't wait for us. He runs. The Lord books it straight to us and throws his arms around us. He says, I love you. You were dead, but now you're alive. You were lost, but now you're found. The Lord runs to us, and he heals that relationship over and over and over again. You want to know why? Because you cannot out the grace of God. Where sin abounds, grace abounds. Should we continue to go on sinning? Surely not, Paul says. But where sin abounds, grace abounds. The Father loves us more than we'll ever know. I want to share three really important lessons from this parable with you today, and then we're going we're gonna to wrap up. Number one is this. Jesus loves us and calls us to love others. This is the first one, that Jesus loves us and calls us to love others. So this parable showcases the power of love within a family. You tracking with me on that? It shows the, the power of love within a family. Jesus presents this story in part as a warning, as a warning to believers to practice love in our own relationships. This includes siblings. This includes our children. This includes extended family, friends, Spouses, boyfriends, girlfriends, fellow believers in Christ, and even, you ready? Our enemies. Our enemies. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And for those of us who have experienced God's grace, which we did not deserve, how much more should we show grace to those around us? How much more? How much more? So that's the first one. Jesus loves us and calls us to love others. Here's the second one. Jesus forgives us and calls us to forgive. Jesus forgives us and calls us to forgive. Part of the conflict in the parable is not that the younger brother uh, was solely focused on sinful behavior. The older son experienced jealousy at the sight of his brother being celebrated. And so this led the older brother to hold anger and animosity toward his brother and his father. 
that there was a perceived offense that he could not and would not forgive. And so even though this blessing was still intact and his father showed compassion toward his anger, the son wouldn't let go of it. He just wouldn't let go of it. So let me ask you, how long will you hold on to a hurt? How long? How long do you hold on to a wrongdoing or an offense? I mean, what's the appropriate amount of time when someone really just ticks you off? How long do you let that stew? How long are we willing to be trapped by our anger and inability to forgive? How long? We need to learn. We need to learn. We need to learn to forgive like Jesus. We need to learn. Because Jesus forgave us of terrible things. And he's forgiven us for the terrible things that we've done, the things that we are doing, and the things that we are going to do. That's so important. This doesn't mean that there isn't a lesson to be learned or consequences for actions, but it does mean that there should always be a pathway toward forgiveness in our relationships and a desire for restoration when, look here, possible. When possible. Now, pay close attention. I want you to hear me say something. Not all relationships need to be restored. Hear me say, not all relationships need to be restored. There are toxic, abusive, and evil people in our lives who can do and have done a lot of harm. And while we can certainly learn to forgive them, because that's how we find freedom, we can learn to forgive them. Jesus isn't necessarily calling us back into a relationship with someone who hasn't changed or hasn't truly repented. Okay? You tracking with that this morning? That's really important. Don't miss that. True forgiveness is hard, and it can be a difficult process, but it's possible for all of us. It's possible for all of us. And so that brings me to our third and our final lesson, number three. Jesus is the healer of our relationships. Jesus is the healer of our relationships. If this parable is teaching us anything, it's that there is no offense too great that Jesus can't forgive when we come to him in repentance and confession. Do you hear that? There's no offense too great. In that space, Jesus does what only Jesus can do. He heals our relationship with the Father. And it's not done by our power. It's done in his power. And that power is available for us to heal. Here, listen. Many of us in here are dealing with pain or hurt separation or unspoken wounds in relationships that we have. Many of us. Maybe it's a parent or a child. Maybe days like today, Father's Day are hard because of a broken or fractured or fragile relationship that you have. I mean, you really want things to be different with your parents. You would give anything to have a great relationship with your child. I mean, you give anything. You haven't spoken to your best friend in months because of maybe a fight or a hurt between you. You're still angry. And you don't think they'll forgive you. Maybe it's your spouse who's hurt you or you've hurt them. Maybe a past relationship or someone you're dating right now. Pains and hurts and sin in relationship, it comes in all shapes and sizes. But none of them, none of them are too big or too deep or too painful for Jesus 
to heal. You want to know why? Because Jesus is the healer of relationships. It's what he does. It's what he does. That's who he is. So what's that one relationship? What's that one hurt? What's that one offense that you need Jesus to heal? What's beyond your power? What's beyond your power to fix? Can you describe it in one word? Can you describe it in a sentence? Or maybe it's just the name of a person that God has brought to mind in these moments. Look, the reality is Jesus knows all the details. All you have to do is be willing to confess your need for his power and his work. So maybe today is the first day that you really say, Lord, I trust you for healing. And if this relationship is going to heal, it will not be in my power. It will be in yours. It will be in yours. Maybe the request that you have today of the Lord is a request that you've had for a long time. Don't give up on it today. Don't make today the day you give up. Jesus works in a time and manner that is, watch, look here, in accordance with his will for our good and his glory. Trust in his power and trust in his timing. And so today's a day where we get to trust Jesus as the healer of our relationships. And so I want all of you to respond today. And every seat in this room, under you or around you, is a little white sticker. It looks like this, a little white label. And I would like to invite all of you. This isn't for the person next to you. This isn't for some of you. This is for all of us because we all have some hurt in some relationship that we need the Lord to heal, whether it's our relationship with him or our relationship with someone else. We all have something we need the Lord to heal. And I'd like to invite you to write. There's plenty of pins around the room. Share with a friend. I want you to write that one word, that one phrase, that one name, that one sentence that you need to submit to Jesus. And here's what we're gonna do with it today. We're gonna make an exchange. We're gonna make a little trade today. You're gonna submit your pain, your hurt, your need for Jesus' power and your trust in exchange for the elements of communion. Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice to restore our relationship back to the Father. He's demonstrated his love for us that while we were still sinners, he died for us. And that bread and that juice represents his broken body and his shed blood to prove he longs to heal our relationships. And so today we're gonna make an exchange. Lord, I'm gonna receive this bread and juice that represents your broken broken body and shed blood and I'm gonna exchange my need for trust in you. And there are baskets at all four of the communion stations. And so in your time, in your moment, when you are ready, I wanna invite you, all of you, make the most of the moment, gang. Write that phrase, that word, that name. And when you're ready, go to one of the four stations, place it in the basket. You can put it face down, receive communion, and then sit and take a few minutes with the Lord and then take communion when you're ready. Does that make sense, what we're gonna do today? What if today was the day that we really trusted Jesus for being the healer that we know he can be? So Father, help us, help us in this moment to be honest and vulnerable, to identify Lord, relationship pain and hurt is real. It is real. And on a day like Father's Day, sometimes it's even more relevant. Lord, I know I stand here as 
as a man that has, I have no one to call today. I, I can re, I'm gonna reach out to my father-in-law, Lord, because he's been such an influence in my life, but I don't have a relationship with my dad. I can't call him today. And there are other people that are just like me, Lord, that, that mourn the loss of that, that feel the pain of that. There are plenty of us in here that don't have great relationships with our kids or with our loved ones or our family or our friends or our spouses, whatever it is, Lord. We can't fix this in our power, Lord. We need you, the healer of all relationships, to step in. And so we exchange this, Lord. We receive your body. We receive your blood in remembrance of you in this moment. Move powerfully bring to mind what it is we need to submit. It is in your precious name that we pray. Amen. Whenever you are ready.